saw is gone forever. It's interesting, you did not, you weren't despondent that night. I wasn't despondent. I, um, I, I knew before it came on that we probably were never going to see it. So I think before it aired on that June 10th, 1991, I was in the frame of mind that enjoy this, enjoy this two hours. This is, especially when I think the opening credits, the way they arranged them, said hour one directed by Tim Hunter, hour two directed by David Lynch. I was like, okay, I'm going to get an hour of David Lynch, Twin Peaks. I'm going to enjoy it because I probably will never get it again. And so I was excited, actually, and, and content, I guess, that Lynch had come back to direct that final hour. Okay. So now we will move to 2017 and um, tell me a little bit about your book and how this came into existence overnight, right? It was just like, boom. Yeah, it was four years overnight. I think it was the Twin Peaks Unwrapped guys, Ben and Brian said, they were interviewing me on a podcast uh, while it was still airing. They said, or, or maybe even before it, it started, are you gonna write about it? And I was like, well, I didn't really have my, you know, I didn't really have a grasp on fire walk with me for 10 years. It took me 10 years to kind of figure out, and now I think I know how, you know, I'm comfortable with it. Uh, so I said, well, it's gonna be a long time before I can write about uh, the return. Um, but, I mean, fortunately, we were doing the Blue Rose magazine, and so my mind was, and I was taking tons of notes uh, on, the, on the show. I had a thick notebook of notes uh, about it, um, and I was constantly thinking about it. It was about 2018, I kind of had a feeling of a theory, a couple of theories that I thought really worked well for, to explain maybe the, the sensibility of the return. And I was in the UK, the UK festival, and I was talking to you about it. And then um, uh, it was March of 2019 that I finally sat down and said, I'm going to write it. So the theory was, I read a really great book called Zona, which was a, a book that um, Jeff Dyer wrote. Uh, his favorite film is uh, the, the Russian film Stalker. Uh, which is uh, Tarkovsky, I pronounced the name wrong, but it's, it's an incredible film. If you've never seen it, I highly recommend it. And he wrote a book where he, he literally walked through every scene of that film because he loved it so much. And I thought, well, I'm going to do that. I'm going to walk through every scene. Well, Stalker's two and a half hours long, and The Return is 18 hours long. And so <laughs> I realized, oh, my God, it's taking me a month to write each part. So I'm like, okay, this is going to take 18 months to write the parts. And then... I have to write some essays to put in, in, you know, to support my theories. So there's, there's eight essays in there. And this is gonna take me a while, and and I actually soon realized um, you can't write every scene in 18 hours. So, oh, actually, I did. I did write every scene, but I didn't print print it off because it would have been boring. Oh, there's missing pieces. <laughs> <of all> the <laughs> We're gonna have to start a letter writing campaign immediately to get this. Um, to you, how soon in the part one or part two did you, I guess we should ask, where did you see part one and part two? I saw part one and part two uh, in Los Angeles with the cast and crew as uh, a guest of Mark Frost. Yeah. I, I'm eternally grateful for Mark Frost. It, it, you know, uh, when we were doing Rap and Plastic, Craig Miller and I, and uh, I want to acknowledge Craig, who passed away a number of years ago, um, a, a, a great Twin Peaks fan. When we were doing Rap and Plastic, uh, we established a really good relationship with Mark Frost, and we uh, covered everything that he did. I mean, the greatest game ever played, his, his golf books, and his other television series. And I don't think he forgot that we, we did that. And um, out of the blue, he sent me an email and said, I've got one ticket. And I said, I'm coming. And I, I went the night, the day before, in case the plane got delayed. I was like, I gotta, I don't want to miss, you know, I don't want to miss any of this. And so anyway, I'm very lucky to go and see it with the, the so how were there too. Yeah, I was outside. outside. Yeah, I was outside. <laughs> but I did get to see everyone and it was a great, and I, I might have, ripped a Bob poster off a wall and shoved it down my pants. Um, 
It, it's true because I told my wife we have to go now. I have Bob in my family. Um, but I wasn't there. But when, um, when in that part one and part two, did you say Twin Peaks is back? Like, was there a moment in watching it where it hit you, or would it not have happened in that moment? You know what I mean? Like, it, like it's had to be a fantasy. I mean, it was for all of us. But was there a, a scene that you were like, whoa? I think probably right as soon as it started, we saw the girl scream. You know, it was a shot from the pilot, screaming run across the courtyard again. I was like, okay, this is great. And then um, very, very quickly, you know, I mean, Cooper's in it right away, the opening scene which was very confusing, but I'm like, okay, this is great. And then, um, honestly, when um, Ben and Jerry are talking in the, in the office, it's like, oh, this is Twin Peaks. Yeah. Now, yeah. I know many of you might think it wasn't Twin Peaks later as it went along, but, but the spirit of it was there then, and I, I felt really good about that. Okay, so let's introduce uh, Josh Minton, who Woo! also loves The Return. Yeah. Um, your path in the Twin Peaks very different than John and I's. Very yeah. Um For you, I'm going to ask you the same question. When was Twin Peaks back for you? When you watched, do you remember watching uh, Part One and Part Two that first night? And was there a time when you thought something that grabbed you? Uh, well, immediately it grabbed me. But I was lucky that I had no nostalgia about Twin Peaks, so I, I watched it with you. Scott Ryan is the greatest shepherd at Twin Peaks that you could imagine. Like, we had a whole process. You had to eat donuts here, read Laura's diary there. And it really was a, a gentle way to, to watch Twin Peaks, but I had no nostalgia for these characters, so right away I was into whatever was happening there on screen. Uh, so much so that I really started to stare at it and look at the numbers and everything. So that was how it became my twin piece. Was that I, I really just jumped in all full hands, but I, I had no nostalgia for what it was going to be. I had no expectations. I, I took what was on the screen and accepted it with, uh, with no reservation. So I was in right away. Um, and then how did you and John start your podcast that covers the return that then, you know, both of you ended up doing books and tell us a little bit about your book. Well, I guess I'll answer that with, with gratitude. I mean, A, amazing that somehow I became a co-creator of two very different podcasts with these, what I will call global experts on, on Twin Peaks and, and even art itself. Um, I'm a lucky boy. I mean, as I look at my beautiful wife here, I've got brilliant friends uh, and I have a uh, couple of venues with which I can express my deep appreciation for art and for, uh, you know, when you meet people weird enough to travel all across the country to come to, you know, film sets that haven't been active for many, many years, and you see the faces and everyone's heart has been broken at some point and then healed over by art, uh, you tend to become a little sensitive to that with other people. And I recognize that immediately. And John, Scott was a little more difficult to pin down. He's got some more uh, like scar tissue there. But uh, I will say that I reached out to John in a moment of need. I had finished the first edition of my book, A Skeleton Key to Twin Peaks. I thought I was done with Twin Peaks. I didn't want to think about it, talk about it, write about it. And then somehow I reached out to John, I think maybe over text. We, we've known each other. He'd been on our show for a couple times. And we spoke for, I want to say, near three hours. And it was a therapy session. <laughs> it, he was deeply involved in, in writing and had kind of hit, got stuck in a couple places. And, and I'm like, John, I think we've got something here. I think there's, I think there's something here. And, and uh, I don't know if you remember more than that. Actually, you had sent a tweet out that said something about, it. someday I hope we, you know, I can debate John Thorne on the stage. <laughs> uh, and I said, well, why should we wait? This was uh, also, uh, the pandemic had just started and we were in our house. And I said, why don't we do a podcast? You know, we're stuck. Let's talk about yeah. Tell me why you were stuck on. We're stuck in the house. Oh, stuck in the house. I can't go anywhere. I got you. And so, you know, let's, let's use that yeah. talk about it. yeah and so um and so by that time i was i was a year and a half into writing the book and um i knew that the podcast was going to help me you just sort of let me sort of think out loud mm -hmm. and you asked me great questions and i was able to kind of work through 
some of the ideas that ended up in there. And that, or sometimes I would write something in there, and I, I, I'd say, oh, I've got this great idea, let's, yeah. and, and again, you were very generous, you let me just cool. sort of talk it through. I want to say something about yeah. that. So, uh, you know, I've listened to John for years on these shows, and it always felt to me like he stopped about four minutes before he wanted to in, in any of his answers. And I thought to myself, I wonder what a show would be like if you let John go until he's done. <laughs> and so very deliberately, very, very deliberately, we, we started to, to actually have that as the forum where we brought up a theme. It wasn't like we didn't watch every show and talk about every show, but we brought up a theme, and I like to, to hand it over to John and just say, talk until you're done, and then leave the space, and then I'll say something, and then you say something, and it's actually a rarity in podcasts because most of them feel like they have to move fast to get out. I wanted space because these are really big ideas, and there's a lot of trauma and pain in, in all of this, and that requires space and patience to come out, and I think it worked. Yeah, I was very happy to do it. It was it was it was great fun. It was a really good thing. To you, what does your book, which is called Ominous Wish, um, what is like the the meatiest part? Like to you, you're like, oh, like you know, everyone out there, they're talking about the return, but like I got this. Okay, well, I I have a theory about Laura's role in the return. And I feel very confident in it. And after I had done, it makes kind of a long story, I don't want to get into too much detail, but obviously some of the things the log lady was saying and, uh, when she's talking to Hawk about um, the circle's almost complete, what will be in the darkness that remains, Laura is the one. And, and she said um, the difference between those um, what's, what's the quote? The, those who are, uh, those who know, I can't remember. Oh, we've got me on up in front of people. I can't. No one's, no one's, no one knows. Yeah, um, uh, so anyway, to to the lot ladies dialogue, when I googled it, I was like, well, this is Hindu theology, and I knew of course that David Lynch was, uh, you know, an adherent of in Hindu theology, and and talks about the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi and. Uh, and, and uses so many uh, Hindu quotes in his book, Catching the Big Fish, and so I knew it was in, it was informing what was happening in there. And then, of course, we were all confused. I think initially, you know, when we watched Part Eight, and the fireman seemingly creates Laura and sends her to Earth, and I'm like, well, what is all this? Um, and so then, after doing some some research on Hindu thinking and uh, mythology, I found, you know, this belief that there is a Vishnu who is the sort of oversee, overseeing presence of the universe, and he sends 10 avatars to Earth over the period of the, the cycle of ages, and uh, the 10th avatar, 10 is the number of completion, the 10th avatar riding a white horse comes to Earth to reset the cycle of ages, which is what I believe Laura does at the end of the series, and, and I thought that kind of fits the idea that the fireman created her and sent her down, and her role was to restart. Laura is the one. The uh, title of the tenth part of the return, the tenth part of the return is Laura is the one. Uh, who will be in the darkness? What will be in the darkness that remains? Uh, so anyway, that to me, it, it felt good, and I wrote that. And while you know it's open to debate, of course, and I don't profess to say I've solved it by any means, the, because there's other great theories uh, that work, but um, but that boy, that really felt right and it felt good and it, it felt like David Lynch's beliefs were being manifested in some of the way he was presenting that. Laura appears in every opening credit sequence of The Return and she's got a golden halo around her. Uh, so anyway, that long answer maybe. But no, I mean, that's what people want. We, we know you've got to go four minutes longer than, than you want. <laughs> so, we're fine. Um, Keep on going. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm going to go Josh, what do you think is the meatiest part of the return? Like, when you really, if you pulled out the heart of it, what would it be, you know, um, to you? Great question. So, uh, I started doing transcendental meditation that 2017 after I came here for the first time. Um, and that process of every day you lose yourself and then get a little bit back 
and that's exactly what happens in the return as well. Pieces kind of drop off and fall out until there's nothing left, and Cooper doesn't even have his identity or his mission in the end, and the only one left with all that baggage is the viewer stuck in the darkness, as John says. So for me, that idea of everything is transitory, that's transitory is but a reference. Like everything ends, we're gonna lose it all eventually. How can we deal with that as we, as we grow older? And I, I'm a Joseph Campbell scholar, have been for years and years and years, and one of the functions of myth that he <coughs> claims is that it teaches you how to grow old and lose with dignity and grace. And for me, the meatiest part of the return is a meditation on a loss for, for everyone and everything. Uh, I think that's the meatiest part of it. Um, and, you know, as John says, what, what does it feel like to you? I'm not interested in being right about the return. What I'm interested in is when someone reads something I write to be as impacted by it emotionally as I was. Um, you know, art is an empathy machine. So if, if we can convey our emotions through our analysis and appreciation of art, someone else can feel that, mission accomplished. I, I'm not concerned with being right intellectually. Um. Talk about expectations and David Lynch. Um, I feel like people who struggle with the return, it has less to do with the return and more to do with their expectations of the return. Um, and maybe, if you can, work in Dougie as a thing. You know, I don't want to point you, but I, do, I am curious to bring Dougie into this. And then we are going to open this up because we really want to hear what you guys say, but I, I want to hear that from you. So I was in New York City, uh, sitting across from David Bushman. Do you know David Bushman? <laughs> and um, he wrote the incredible book, uh, the Mark Frost book, Conversation with Mark Frost. So that's one of the five probably best books you can get on, on research in Twin Peaks. But um, he said we have to approach the new Twin Peaks before it came on. We have to approach the new Twin Peaks on David Lynch's terms, not on our terms. I was like, okay, I think you're right. We have to, they're going to give us what they're going to give us, and so we have to meet them at, at, at their spot. And I think that Lynch and Frost were both very interested in not doing a nostalgia trip. I think they were. They wanted to tell a story that had a lot to do about aging, about life, about how we you know, change, and how sometimes we hold on to the past maybe too tightly. And so, um, you know, all of that was... Uh, was in my mind, I think, when I was watching it. And I felt that, um, I, can, I, I write about this at the beginning of the book, I really understand why some fans of the original series rejected the new show. I, I understand and I, I, I sympathize, I guess, with that. But, you know, in my mind, this new series, The Return, never, didn't change the original show. It's just as wonderful as it always was. I don't think, if you watch The Return, I don't think for me, I guess, I should say for me, I, I don't feel differently about the original series, even if maybe it started playing with the uh, <laughs> with some of the established facts. It's still an incredible show. The, the pilot, the series, and the movie are incredible. The firewall for me. Uh, this series was asking us to sort of keep Twin Peaks in mind, but to also think about it maybe from a different perspective, and how we... Lynch and Frost, and how we, specifically, I think maybe some of the viewers who watched it in 1990 are different people 30 years later. I think that's an important factor in watching the show. I, I think so. You didn't mention that. <laughs> oh, I'm talking about Dougie. I want to talk real quick. I love Dougie. I think Dougie's one of the best parts of the show. I don't understand why people don't like Dougie. I think the idea of Dougie is such a wonderful thing that Lynch, and both Lynch and Frost, uh, wanted to show what it was like to have a character who was purely good. He's, he is, when I saw the face of God, I was changed. He is an angel on earth. Anyone who comes in contact with Dougie becomes a better person. Every single character yes. who encounters Dougie becomes better. Yes. And the, just because he's, a, he's good. And uh, you know, Craig and I, I'll make this real quick, Craig and I wrote a thing about what is a purely good Cooper? This is wrapped in plastic. And I wrote that he would be, you know, a perfect detective, and he could do, he could, you know, he, he could do anything, be like a superhero. And but he would, he would be, um, he would also be flawed because he couldn't be, a, he couldn't take any action because any action he takes 
could potentially result in a negative outcome. And, and so Craig had a different take on it. And neither one of us got it right. I think Lynch and Frost really thought through the idea of what would it be like if you had a purely evil and a purely, we all know it'd be pure, the purely evil is gonna be this chaotic agent who's gonna wreck the world. But what's a purely good person gonna do? They're gonna make you better. I think that's great. I think it's one of the best things of the show. Yeah, I thought if, if, and I have never written about Dougie, but if I wrote about Dougie, I would connect it to the straight story because I think yes. the lines between the straight story and De I think the straight story is pre Dougie, but this isn't about me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we want to kind of get some debates about the return. They are the expert. I'll call on you, Sharon. <laughs> <Sit down. laughs> Um, you know, these guys have seen the return probably more than any of us. Um, so we want to we want we want to hear about you guys and the return, and and let's fight until we punch each other. Sharon, what do you got? All right. Uh, so going back to what you were saying about Laura being the one. Um, so I have a friend who, after the return, she hated Cooper because she thought that by him interfering with Laura on the night that she died, he's the one that set off this time loop. So now she's just like destined for all eternity to repeat the trauma that happened to her. Were you trying to say that because Laura is the one that that would have happened no matter what, whether Cooper interfered with her or not? Yes, actually, I, I think that's true. And I think David Lynch may have rethought, he came back to it many years later, so yeah, I think he, he didn't have this, these ideas in mind when he was making the, the series and Firewalk with me, but it, it seemed right for him to do it this way. But I do believe that, yeah, Laura it would have been the one, and I don't believe that Cooper, I don't believe that Cooper saved her and, 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 and prevented her from dying. I, I, I think she had to go through that. She had to experience that. If I, because the end of Firewalk with me is extremely powerful, and it's extremely powerful because Laura finds her goodness. She realizes she is a good person. She is worthy. Because she's lost, she says her angels have gone away, you know, the whole thing, that she feels like she's worthless. But she realizes at the end that she is worthy, and that was essential for her to then achieve something better. If you watch the, the, a lot of people forget about this, but there is a David Lynch directed short, which is called Between Two Worlds, where Lynch is effectively uh, interviewing the Palmer family. He's interviewing Sarah Palmer. It's in a, it's a bonus on the uh, Gold Box. Okay. And um, he interviews Laura Palmer. And she says, you know, this is dialogue that was written by Lynch. When I saw the truth, I was happy and I knew you know, I was changed, I can't remember exactly what her lines are, but the indication is there that Lynch was thinking that when Laura died and, and saw her angel, that she, um, she achieved something else and understood her, her role in the universe. I know it gets complicated, she's dead, how can she be back, all of that, I, I can go into it, maybe we'll do it after. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so um, I, I, I think Cooper is the one who's confused and lost and trying to do things that he, he doesn't understand. And he's making a mistake when he goes and tries to save Laura. I think that's why she disappears in the woods, because he can't, he can't do it. Uh, he doesn't understand, he has to, he's not about him. That's Cooper's biggest failing. It's not about him. He, he thinks he's the superhero. But when Diane appears to him, which I, it's this exaggerated scene, and she says, Cooper, the one and only, that's what he wants to hear. He is, he's in his own way, he's gotten in the way of himself. He stands in front of everyone and he tells them what's gonna happen. He thinks he's the one. He's not, Laura is the one. He needs to step aside, and he never really learns that. And at the end, he's lost because he never quite understood that his role was just to guide her to where she needed to be. So. Thank you. Do we have a question, uh, Allison? I just have a quick question, not specifically about the return, but kind of when you did the research for the book and you were studying the Vedic traditions and these things. One was that new to you, and also after it was you were complete with the with the book. Did any of that learning stick with you in a way that didn't exist before for you? So to answer the second question, yes, I did kind of open my mind to 
my own personal way of, of dealing with life and the universe and everything. And because um, there's some fascinating and valuable teachings in Hindu uh, theology. But the, the first question, I really didn't know anything about it. I really didn't. And I knew I had to figure some of it out. It's very, very complex. And, and I, I say in the book, and I will say to you now, I, I don't know a lot. I mean, I truly don't. You probably have to spend decades really immersing yourself. I bought a book called Hinduism for Dummies. And, <laughs> and that was a valuable book for me, because I was a dummy on that. And, and it pointed me in the right directions to at least, I think, talk about it with some um, you know, Solid foundation underneath, um, but there are people who follow, you know, know far more about it than, than I ever probably. What ever about will. you, Josh? So, uh, Joseph Campbell was a premier Hindu scholar, so I came in contact with a lot of the ideas earlier. He has a fantastic book of his journals from traveling in the 1950s called Bakshish and Brahman, which was great. Um, so, a lot, a lot of those concepts were, were fairly ingrained for, for me. And uh, when John and I started to discuss it, a lot of it started to come back. Now, I, I deliberately, through, through my study of a BFA in creative writing in a workshop-based setting, uh, study short stories where you're supposed to detract yourself away from the writer. Um, I, I'm not interested in what the writer, the author, or the director thinks or, or cares about me personally. I would rather draw a frame around the art itself and have my reaction to it. So John and I get to the same conclusion, I think, but we're about four degrees off on how we get there, and that's great. I think it's, it's driven a lot of fantastic conversations. Hinduism's important, but I've never leaned on it for my analysis or appreciation. Cool. Uh, I think... Oh, yeah, I was just uh, going to say about, like, the evolution of the arm uh, in part uh, 18. Like, that tons Cooper uh, for, like, actually trying to save Laura, like, the, the Audrey line. So I've always thought of that, like... Uh, Cooper didn't, like, sort of, uh, didn't face up the consequences about Mr. C done, basically. That he should have like, sort of faced up the consequences mm -hmm. of And obviously, eventually, Mr. C done. But instead, he went back to uh, sort of save water. And the evolution arm's taunting him about that. With the evolution arm, the arm telling him to go? And uh, is this a story of the little girl who lives down the lane? Is that? Yeah, that's the same. Yeah. The little girl lives down the lane. I believe the little girl lives down the lane. I believe the little says. girl lives down the lane. Yeah. And so when the evolutionary arm says that to Cooper, yeah. there's a flashback immediately, almost immediately, he yeah. sees Laura. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, like and, that, and so he comes to realize, okay, yeah. the little girl who lives down the lane is, is Laura Palmer. I think Audrey certainly comes to realize that. Um, I, I have a chapter in there yeah. exclusively about Audrey's story, which is, I personally, I do a lot. I watched uh, here, up, up here in the Palmer house, I watched part 12, which introduces Audrey to the story with a group of fans, um, and many of them were unhappy at the end of that because they didn't like what happened with Audrey. Uh, I was certainly uncertain about what happened to Audrey, but uh, in subsequent viewings, I think the Audrey story is one of the most amazing things. It's a story in four acts, and in each act of Audrey's story, not to go too up on a tangent here, but each act, she moves further and further out of a house that she's stuck in. Each one, she moves closer and closer to the door until the fourth act where she's out. And once she's out, she releases herself. She's joyful in a moment of dancing. And Lynch talks about, in Catching the Big Fish, the idea of you could find um, the, the white, absolute white, uh, is sort of transcendent. Well, she ends up in this white space. Yes, she's sort of uncertain about where she is, but I believe she moves through. Anyway, there's a, there's a se sequence in that where um, she says to Charlie, um, what story is that? Is it the story of the little girl who lives down the lane? And I think it's there she realizes, oh, I too am not the focus of the story. It's Laura's story. And I tried, you know, I thought maybe Cooper would want to pay attention to me. He only was trying to pay attention to Laura. And she comes to realize, okay, I'm, I'm not Cooper's focus. Uh, and, and then that is helpful to her on her path. Great. Another question? Uh, needle phobia? <laughs> Oh, our um, so I, um, I actually was planning to ask you about Audrey, but you've already talked about that. Um, so where do you think Audrey ends up? I mean, what is this white lady you're talking about? Uh, I think Audrey, I don't know where, for sure, where she ends up. I, you know, it could be that she just realizes her reality is in a mental institution. She's no longer lost in the fugue of her mind where she's imagining this uh, bizarre existence with Charlie. Uh, 
I, I, I try to be optimistic with the return, and I know it's hard sometimes because it seems dark. And in fact, the show ends with a piece of music called Dark Space Low. So, you know, it sort of implies that it's, it's, it's dark and, and unfortunate, but I try to be optimistic, and I believe Audrey awakens. I don't know for sure where she is, but that scene is a scene of awakening. And although she's startled in it, I believe she finally freed herself from the things, the mental things that were holding her back, the trauma that was holding her back. She was able to get past it. So that's my optimistic take on it. I don't know if that answers your question, but okay. Uh, yes, James. So I agree with the you know the aging process between Twin Peaks the original series and Return. It's the story about change, and my my feeling, probably a few other people's feeling, is that the darkness took over Twin Peaks beyond the end of season two. By the end of the Return, do you feel that the darkness still won, or do you think it's quite a some people feel like it's quite a happy yeah, ending in a way, like it, like Cooper won and Judy gone. And do you feel like it's like a, the darkness did win in the end? I think you are. You get to choose whether the darkness wins. And so there's a lot of characters in the Return that are stuck in the past, and they can't break free of. Uh, you know, it's funny. Josh and I have been reading a book called The Passenger by Cormac McCarthy, which is an incredible book. Cormac McCarthy is one of the greatest writers of all time, and he has a line in The Passenger which is, we would hardly wish to know ourselves again as once we were, and yet we mourn the days. Which is that we, we wish for nostalgia, we wish to be young again how we were 20, 30 years ago. And yet, he, he makes the observation that he probably wouldn't want to know who we were back then. I think a lot of characters in The Return are stuck um, in the past. Certainly, James is one, a great example. He's on the stage singing to those avatars of Donna and Maddie. He can't move forward. I think the characters who find, who become to know who they truly are, Andy's a great example. Andy is a good person. Lucy is too. They're very content with their lives, and they're happy even if there's darkness around them. I think that's sort of the key, uh, um, one of the key uh, themes of the new Twin Peaks is that if you can find, come, to come content with who you are and you're happy with, with who you are, then the darkness won't, won't impact you. Those who are still trying to find out who they are or, or, or feel that who they were in the past is, defines them, then they're, then they're stuck. And so that that's how I I take it. But I think Josh probably also has. So just just a quick one. Uh, one. One of the meditative phrases in Twin Peaks: The Return that stays with me is what the American Girl told Cooper before he goes through the little socket, which is, "When you get there, you will already be there." And for me, that's that's so poignant. And it sounds like such a throwaway, cheap line, but it, it's true. When when we arrive. I've already been there and, and carry the past with us. And to John's point, that nostalgia can drag you down and murder you. I mean, it absolutely will. But if you can let it go and keep the sweetness, there's a, a transcendent revelation there that's worth pursuing. So. I like it. Amy, are we staying here or we're going there? Okay. So at least we now know that the next panel will not take place here. We'll be going a couple streets down to, or a couple blocks down to uh, the Eagles for the other panels. But we still have about five minutes or so, and then I want, John is going to be signing books. He's got books to sell, um, so I want to... Let me just quickly, I went down to the Trading Post just before I came here, and I signed all the books there. They asked me to do that, and I was happy to. And I do have books here, and I'd be happy to sell these books, uh, but I want to support the local businesses here. And so if you're interested in my book um, and you want to buy it, uh, please consider at least going to the Trading Post. Uh, they were very good to both Scott and me yesterday, and, um, and they're good people. And so they have that and Scott's book and a bunch of other books down there. And so um, anyway, that's just right. giving them a plug. Definitely. Uh, if you want to have but, a moment with Charlie. And I'm certainly happy to, to just sign for my books. Right. I'd be happy to sign them. And, uh, <laughs> good stuff. So, no, I mean, that's fine. I think we still have time. I mean, we've got time. I just wanted to, to be sure that, that people knew. So um, anyone want to, uh, let me 
Mr. Stephen Miller. Oh, my goodness. David Lynch is an artist, and so much of his work is like living paintings. Is there an image from The Return that sticks with you? Because I know, like, in Firewalk with me, there's images or certain things that, that I personally just gravitate to, can't wait to see, look forward to seeing again, could watch it again and again and again. Is there something that sticks? So his question was about an image that sticks with them about the return, from the return. Yeah, so the, the easy answer is the atomic explosion, but I, I you know, everyone thinks of that. I do, in, in, in the first thought of that atomic explosion, which is incredible. But, honestly, I think part three, when Cooper goes to, uh, I call it the Purple Realm, or the Moab Room, whatever anyone wants to call it, where NATO is there, all of that sequence is just stunning, the, the, the stuttering movements. And then that shot where he and NATO are out on the box in the starry field and they're just floating there in space. It's just amazing. I mean, would any of us thought of something like that? And then they just like, you know what? You're gonna go up through the ladder and you're gonna be on top of this box and out in the, in the middle of nowhere in space. And so that, that shot comes to mind. Do you have one? I do, yeah, I do. Um, this comes from Emily's conversation with like, what would you get in the Twin Peaks podcast? And I've got the answer now, I've got a good answer. Uh, I'll have a cyanide capsule, right? And then you're sitting there for a moment just watching this man in total pain. It's the worst you've ever seen it in any of it. And then all of a sudden this hand just comes onto his shoulder. And what a beautiful image that is. Like, it sticks with me. It's one of my favorite moments from my favorite part. Part 15 is my favorite part of Twin Peaks. Um, and I just, I love that image so much. It's got so much gold in it. It's precious. And, you know, I think we'd have to go for years for John and I to agree on anything, but honestly, mine is part three. I didn't know that was your favorite, too. I, that whole sequence, to me, calls back to what people call Cooper's Dream in episode two, where, it, you know, you were watching television break, and, I, and like you, I know everyone goes to part eight because that's an easy part, and of course it's spectacular. Part three is my favorite part, and will always be. I mean, it's just beautiful. I just love that. Um, Spencer? Uh, for all three of you, uh, we love to talk about movies and TV shows, all of us do, and you know, Twin Peaks is right up there at the top with interpretations and discussions, podcast books, all that. Um, but, you know, what, why, why do we talk about it in the first place? So, like for each of you, what, what is it that uh, com compels you to want to talk about it and to discuss it? Are you saying television in general or Twin Peaks? Twin Peaks okay. in specifically. Yeah. Josh, you're good. Well, I think it's one of the few audiovisual works of art where anyone, anyone in this room can take their trauma that they've had in the past and they can wrap it up inside this art and they can talk about themselves in the abstract in the most personal ways and go ahead, talk to anyone and they're going to tell you what their story is with this and it's going to be unique and it'll be a gift that they're handing you and you will have healed them as well. So Twin Peaks is one of the few works of art where you can actually do that universally. You don't have to be a certain age or a certain you know gender or identity. You know, your identity doesn't matter. It's how you respond to it, and then you can give that as a gift to someone else and take theirs as well. And I think that's really powerful and rare. Yeah, I'm going to try to make this real quick because when I first watched Twin Peaks when it was on in 1990, my attraction to it was, oh, this is television being used as it should be. Because before that, with few exceptions, you know, you had episodic and. and, and it didn't take advantage of the medium. But that has changed over time. For me, uh, Twin Peaks now, similar to what Josh is saying, is that um, it's a work that I think you see as much of yourself in as you do the story that Mark Frost and David Lynch are telling. I think everyone who really loves it, find, it, I just, part of yourself comes out I think, you, whether you're just keeping it to yourself and you're thinking about it, or you're talking about it with friends, which is so valuable. You have a great quote where Twin Peaks happens when you're not watching it. And that's so true when you're talking to other people uh, about it. But I, I really believe that you, um, you learn about yourself when you're watching it. Yeah, um, a, a quick story. I was pitching one of the books that we have um, to 
Netflix about doing a movie, and they, um, I, I wanted to have these characters propose, but you didn't find out the answer. And everyone in the room was like, what do you mean you don't find out the answer? I'm like, no, you won't know if she says yes or no. And then so when the movie's over, some friend would say, she said yes, and this person would say, she said no, and so people will like that. It ended the meeting. <laughs> the reason we talk about Twin Peaks is because David Lynch had the power to have open-ended questions. Regular people pitching a TV show, they're like, are you kidding me? And like, it got so watered down that you know it didn't get picked up and nothing happened because you just took the life out of everything. Mm -hmm. Twin, and I really, when I was in these, I actually said, have you ever seen Twin Peaks? You don't have to answer questions. But that's why, because what year is this? In fact, I did an article in the Blue Rose where each season ans ends on a question. Um, I forget what the one for Andy is. Like, are you okay? Or what does he say yeah, on the phone? Are you okay? Yeah, are so that okay? one, and then how's Annie? And then uh, what year is this? So it's, you know, it's incredible. Um, one more question. Let's, let's do it. Someone really, really, really good. Let's get us fighting. This was too nice. <laughs> what do you got, Bill? Well, I don't know if I can get go up fighting, but how surprised were you if you were surprised in part 14 when Andy is suddenly the superhero? <laughs> <laughs> well, when I first watched it, I was I was shocked when Andy disappeared. Really scared because I, I everybody loves Andy and you don't want anything to happen to Andy and he disappeared. And so I. Um, was worried for him, and then when he came back, holding NATO, I was like, oh, great, you know, Andy's the hero of the story, at least for now. And it was really only for those few minutes. He's, he's, he, he seems to really know what's going on. It seems to fade away, as things do. They fade away from your mind. Um, so I guess uh, the short answer is initially worried for him, but then it felt right as I watched it. Well, I want to thank everyone, and um, like I said, now we're going to move down to the Eagles, and Vinny's doing two panels, then I'll be back, because you haven't had enough of me, to do some other panels with actors from Twin Peaks and the Location Scouts, so there's still a lot more to happen. Uh, thank you, John, and please, um, I've got books here to sign and sell, John has books, uh, Come see us, and we'll see you down at the Eagles.